I want to think a little bit about the culture of the world when Jesus came to this earth. What was the predominant culture? It was the Greek culture. The Greeks under Alexander the Great had conquer, conquered the world. And though that empire didn't last long, their culture did. And I want to think about how the Greek culture would have affected God's people, in particular the Jews, when Jesus came to this earth. Well, the Greeks had a superior culture. Their art was superior. And it's interesting as you look at the art of those who came before the Greeks and you see their lack of proportion and you kind of had uncoordinated stick figures. But the Greeks learned uh, about art and the, their art is admired even until today. You think about Greek architecture. Uh, it's admired even today. Uh, as I started to say, some of you may have been to Nashville and seen the replica of the Parthenon, and some of you have probably been to Athens and seen the real thing. Uh, the Greek columns, and are, we see replicated even to this century. Philosophy. Even today, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato are quoted and analyzed, and I can't understand them. There's some smart people that can, but it still affects the uh, philosophy of today. When you think of Greek religion, it was paganism. Now, that's a word that kind of has a low class connotation today. When you think of pagans, you think of a motorcycle gang or something like that. But the opposite was true in the first century. In the first century, paganism was considered high class. And yet it produced a moral decadence that's not really hard to imagine. Can you imagine a god of wine and what the worship of that god would have produced? Or a god of erotic love? A god of war? And when Jesus came to the earth, the Greek religion had produced all kinds of corruption. We talk often of divorce and how it ran rampant among uh, those of Jesus' day, it was considered nothing just to drop one husband and marry another. Slavery, just the whole Greek world was controlled economically through the slavery and the slave culture. And homosexuality and other sexual perversion, most of the Roman emperors were sexually perverted. Well, how did the Jews, the people of God, confront this pervasive Greek culture. It was so superior to them in architecture, art, and philosophy, and they, the Jews were really quite backwards in those areas compared to the Greek. Well, there are different approaches that Jewish people took, took towards Greek culture. Uh, when we think of a group called the Sadducees, we think of compromise. Now, the Sadducees had their origin in the political maneuvering of the Jews just after the time of the Maccabees. And most of them were descendants of the Maccabees. They became the sect of the priest. And they pretty much controlled the Jewish government under the Romans. And they wanted to compromise with the Greek ideas in every way possible. They considered it to be superior to the Jews. They dressed like the Greeks. They gave Greek names to their children. They even exercised nude in the gymnasiums like the Greeks. And of course, that would have been anathema to the careful Jews of their day. Well, what was their attitude towards the Old Testament scriptures that God had given them? They claimed to respect them. And yet the Old Testament scriptures contradicted uh, Greek culture in so many ways. So they tried to find ways to get around them. In particular, they allegorized them. And they considered that in the Old Testament book, what you have is some kind of a hidden uh, symbolic meaning. A Jew named Philo of Alexandria said that only an ignoramus or to something to this effect would take the Bible literally. Luke in Acts chapter 23 and verse 8 made his commentary on them. He said they do not believe in angels. They do not believe in spirits because those concepts were absurd to Greeks. There was no way they were going to accept them. So compromise, try to harmonize Greek ideas with Old Testament scriptures, which is pretty much an impossibility. That was the way they tried to deal with the Greek culture of their day. 
But then, of course, there was another group, the Pharisees. And uh, their way of dealing with all the invading Greek culture was just to kind of wrap themselves up in traditionalism and, a, and an inward focus on themselves. And they love the internal battles among themselves because as they were battling each other, they didn't have to worry about all the evil that was going on around about them. They began really as a group that was going to oppose the Greek ideas and they constantly battled the Sadducees uh, about their compromise and their battles were so bitter now, on one occasion, one leader of the Sadducees crucified 800 Pharisees. You can imagine the hatred that must have existed between those groups. But even though the Pharisees were correct in opposing the compromise of the Sadducees, they themselves had gone far away from God in so many areas. Uh, Jesus talked in particular about the errors of the Pharisees. There in Luke chapter 18, when he was talking about one of them who went up to pray, Jesus said of, that Pharisee, of the Pharisee, they trusted in themselves as righteous. He mentioned that one in particular, but I think he was referring to something that, that could characterize the group in general. They despised others. They had a kind of a superiority complex. They bound their interpretations as law. And examples that we know well in John chapter 9, when Jesus healed that blind man, they put up a big fuss because healing on the Sabbath, as far as they were concerned, was work. And same thing happened in Luke chapter 13, verse 14, uh, when Jesus cur killed the woman with the curved back on the Sabbath and other cases as well. Uh, in Mark chapter 7 and verse 5, we see them all upset because the disciples of Jesus ate with unwashed hands. And that was a, a violation of the tradition of the elders. And as far as they're, we're concerned, their traditions, their interpretations were law. So in summary, the Pharisees confronted paganism with tradition, with spiritual self-sufficiency, binding in their own interpretations as law and an inward focus, an obsession with internal battles. Well, we think of the Sadducees and their approach to Greek culture and the Pharisees. But there was another Jew who took on Greek culture. And of course, you know, I'm talking of Jesus Christ. How did Jesus deal with Greek culture? Well, first of all, how did he not deal with it? Well, he rejected the compromising spirit of the Sadducees, Jesus taught there is a resurrection. You remember there uh, in Matthew chapter 22, when the Sadducees brought a woman to Jesus, or they didn't bring a woman to, they brought a hypothetical case to Jesus about a woman who married seven men. One died, married the next, and the next, and the next. And so she had seven husbands in all. Which one's going to be her husband in the resurrection? Jesus' answer in, in, in verse 29 reveals a lot about his opposition to them. Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. That's the problem with all compromisers today. Usually they don't know the scriptures Neither do they know the power of God. Whenever they begin to doubt, could God do this? Could God allow uh, his son to be born of a virgin? Uh, could God uh, cause the earth to be covered with a flood? They begin to doubt on the basis of, of simple lack of acknowledgement of the power of God in the scriptures. After this, Jesus just took them on and showed from the scriptures and logic that they were wrong in saying that there was no resurrection. And that's something that compromisers don't like today, scriptures and logic. Jesus quoted the Old Testament histories as fact, not as allegories. As far as Jesus was concerned, Jonah was a real person. Adam and Eve were real people. And uh, he referred to them in his re in references to marriage and divorce in Matthew 19 and other passages. So Jesus uh, not only rejected the Sadducees, but he attacked almost 
with more vigor the arrogant pride of the Pharisees. Jesus taught that it's possible to serve God, to be holy without being self-righteous and arrogant. And how did he do that? Jesus spent time with sinners. In Matthew chapter 9, he was criticized for it. Why do you spend time with, with these types of people? But how would it be possible to help them without spending time with them? Who are the heroes of the Pharisees in the stories of Jesus? The priest? The scribes? The rich people? If they're mentioned in Jesus' parable, it's used, they don't usually come across looking very good. Think of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Who are the heroes? They are the tax collectors, the Samaritans, the shepherds, the humble people of his day. Jesus criticized the Pharisees for getting so wrapped up with little details and being indifferent to the great principles of the law. Uh, and of course, a summary of that criticism, which is found all through the 23rd chapter of Matthew, is in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. This is very important in understanding what is wrong with Phariseeism. Jesus said, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint, anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These ought you to have done without leaving the others undone. Let me ask you a question, a trick question. Was the error of the Pharisees just that they were too conservative? Notice what Jesus said here. These you ought to have done. He did not criticize them for being careful to tie the men and Annas and coming. That wasn't what was wrong with them. What was wrong with them was that it, though they were concerned and justifiably so for some of these external matters, what did they overlook? The weightier matters, justice, mercy, and faith. Well, if Jesus rejected the uh, methods of the Sadducees and the Pharisees, how did he overcome it? Well, as you see here, he overcame it first with personal holiness. He worked to instill that within his followers. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16. Notice the emphasis here that he gave to his followers through the apostle Peter about personal inward holiness. Jesus through Peter tells us, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the formal lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. You know, the holiness of early Christians was stood in, dark, in, in, in great contrast to the ungodliness and the carnality of the first century Greek world in which they lived. And it had to have stood out. Here you have people divorcing, giving themselves over to lasciviousness, and all of a sudden in their midst appear these loving people who have all kinds of self-control. It must have made an impact. But not only did Jesus overcome paganism and his followers through their personal holiness, through an intense fervent love. We know the verse, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The concept of unselfish love was unknown to pagans. And here again, in their midst, all of a sudden appears a group of people who are completely disinterested in self and concerned with helping others, including those evil pagans and efforts to serve and to help, that must have been very attractive. What a beautiful contrast. Jesus taught his followers to overcome paganism through an unwavering faith in the midst of persecution. That persecution was already beginning by, in, the, in the latter part of the first century. And Peter writes to Christians who are beginning to suffer this. And how should they deal with it? They should look to Jesus as their example. For to this you were called, 
because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. And that is exactly the spirit that early Christians showed when they began to be tortured and suffered by the Romans. And you know, those old pagans didn't know how to deal with that. Uh, there was no in your face, you'll see that we're right. We'll challenge you to debate. We'll show that you are wrong. None of that. I think brethren need to avoid that type of attitude today in dealing with paganism. Instead, there was a calm and overcome evil with good confidence among many and most Christians, even as they face torture and death. Now I want to ask you, in dealing with that ugly Greek paganism, which, of, which approach was most effective? Did the Sadducees get anywhere in dealing with that paganism with their compromise? Of course not. They made no impact upon the Greek world. And the Pharisees, with their inward focus and obsession within, with, with their traditions, they made no impact upon it. Who made an impact on the Greek world? It was Jesus. And of his father, it was said, those who have turned the world upside down have come here. Jesus Christ overcame paganism, not with compromise, not with traditionalism, but with holiness and love and dedication. You could probably preach the rest of this sermon for me, but I know you stick around a little longer, but I think you know where I'm going is what I'm saying. Do we live in a pagan world? When we say pagan, we mean idolatrous. And of course we do. And what are the idols that we have today? Money? Uh, greed is idolatry, according to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. And you see greed more and more and more. I, I know oftentimes when people want to think of greed, they want to think of white collar greed. You know, big oil is making tons of money and, and uh, all the stock market frauds and all the investments. And that's greed. Well, I guess it is. But I, sometimes I, see, I don't think that a lot of what we sometimes blue collar people around us are any less affected by greed. Whenever I go into uh, the 7-Eleven or the quick check, I have to wait in line between, behind five or ten people who are going to make it rich. They're going to hit the lottery this time. And I saw an older couple, must have been in their 80s, little sweet little couple in there, and, and they were getting a bunch of money. And, 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 and I said, well, ask the cashier, what do they want that money for? She pointed out the lottery machine over there. They were feeding the machine with $20 bills. Greed. And uh, I don't know, I guess I'm taking it out on little old ladies now, but when I hear little old ladies in New Jersey talk about the big excitement of the life, went to Atlantic City, and, and Atlantic City's the big thing. It's greed. That's, that's uh, a part of the pagan world that we live in today. Uh, pleasure. What the fancy word for that, hedonism. Yeah, have you noticed how much, and I think it's affecting our children. You notice how, let's have fun. Is it fun? And sometimes we say, let's go do something together. Is it fun? And I sometimes say, well, I don't know if you say fun or not. It'd be pleasurable. Uh, well, if it's not fun, they're not interested. And I think one of our big challenges is teaching our children that there's a difference between having fun and living a meaningful life satisfactory life. Satisfaction and fun aren't always together. There are a lot of people I can talk to you about that have a lot of fun, but they're not satisfied with their lives. They don't have meaningful lives. The world doesn't understand this. If it's not fun, they don't want to hear of it. Pleasure is their God. And we even see a return of that old witchcraft and uh, the old superstitions that accompany it. Uh, we, even, we even see, uh, well, I missed that. We'll stick with that. We even see uh, women who say, my other car is a broom, or my other mode of transportation is a broom, and it's kind of funny. But what do you have? You have somebody there saying, I'm a witch. Uh, a humor, one with a sense of humor, maybe, but 
I, I remember reading an, uh, an article one time talking about witchcraft and, and, and one of the person was saying, this is why I'm getting involved in this, because in Christianity, men dominate. In witchcraft, women dominate. Oh, she really liked that. So she's going to go back to all that, uh, that absurd uh, superstition. We have our New Age movement with the astrology, the crystals, Nostradamus. Don't you worry about Nostradamus, but I'm not going to get off on that. He was a fraud just like Jeannie Dixon and, uh, and a lot of these others. Don't you worry a bit about him. But that's all a part of the new paganism that we live in today. And if you stop and think about it, it's just um, copy, uh, warmed over paganism that was existing in the days of Jesus. Well, how are we going to confront it? How are we going to deal with the paganism of today? Well, there's so many people today who want to deal with it with compromise, just like the Sadducees. And you just see even Christians who want to give in, give in a little here, give in a little there. The worldly entertainment, the celebrity culture. You know, it's amazing how people just get so excited about the celebrities. And, and wow. And you feel like saying, I guess this is one insult that I kind of like, even though it's nasty and I won't use it. Get a life. It's not a good insult. But when people just wrap themselves up in these shallow people and, and, and all excited about it, you know, if it were nice to say, you could say, just get a life, get your own life. Maybe it would be another way to, 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 to put that, uh, that thing. But that's what we see a lot of religious people involved in. Worldly clothing, we've talked about that several times this week. I don't want to beat a dead horse. But um, that's, what, that's where we find ourselves compromising so often. And I'm thinking right now of godly people I know who you, oh, that I've known over, when you get to be 50, you see changes over a period of time. Just a little compromise here, a little compromise there. And I guess if I'm honest, maybe I am compromising myself a little bit in regards to this type of thing. It's so easy to allow this to happen. A refusal to take the scriptures at face value you know, if you quote the Bible today so often, you'll see those rolled eyes, especially on some of these TV shows where they're discussing some moral issue and somebody has the audacity to quote the scriptures. Oh, no, I can't believe this Bible thumper is coming in here to mess up our program by quoting this 2000 year old book. And a lot of people who claim to be Christians in the broad sense of the word do not want to take the scriptures at face value. There are some things in the scriptures that are just not politically correct. Uh, well, let me see. I'm, I'm going to have to redo my outline here, but I'll just go through them here. Don't worry about that. Romans chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, just outright, out and out, condemns homosexuality and homosexual acts. And yet I have a tract at home which is supposedly by those who claim to be Christians, which states that Romans chapter 1 is not talking about two homosexuals that love each other. It's talking about those homosexuals that abuse each other. And so that doesn't apply to us, and Jesus wasn't talking about that. What do we have? Compromise, a refusal to take the scriptures at face value. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, limits the role of women in, in leadership. And talk about not being politically correct. Those verses are not politically correct. And uh, so we see those who claim to be Christians trying to compromise and trying to find a way around that issue. Uh, it was about a year and a half ago, I went and met with some brethren in Manhattan who have decided that this text does not does not prohibit women from taking a leadership role. And, and what they say is that this text is just condemning those Ephesian women who violently usurped authority. And they say that that word usurp authority is the same word for homicide. So I guess they're concerned about Ephesian women's killing off the men or whatever. And that's all that that text is, 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 is condemning. And so they compromise with it. And of course, on divorce and remarriage, Matthew 5, 32, Matthew 19, 9, Jesus prohibits divorce except for fornication. 
And yet that's not politically correct today. And so we find ways to try to compromise with that and get around it. The bottom line is that many churches today claim to follow Jesus, but their spirit of compromise has taken the life out of them and rendered them irrelevant. Someone's pointed out the old church buildings in England and Europe in general, it's, England's full of church buildings, but how many of them are practical? Most of them are, are either, either have been turned into museums or they've been abandoned or perhaps sold to Muslims to, to make a mosque. English, English religion has been compromised to the point that it's completely irrelevant to most Englishmen today. Same thing's going to be happening in our country. And it's the result of what happens with the spirit of compromise. We would like to say that we only see the spirit of compromise out there in the broad religious world. But it's, it's among those we consider our brethren and even brethren that we've had fellowship with in the past. If, if you have a lot of teaching about Bible authority or a lot of teaching about worldliness, you'll see eyes begin to roll a little bit and there he goes again. And some of you've probably heard of uh, people of, like Max Lucado and others who, who are in congregations where, of course, 1 Timothy 2 is taken out of, of the way, where there's fellowship with mainstream denominations, instrumental music, of course, and other unauthorized biblical practices have been brought in. It's, it's all around us, the spirit of compromise. Well, somebody might say, does that spirit of compromise frighten you? It does. It's dangerous. It takes people away from God. But you know, there's something else that frightens me. And that is that in reacting to Max Lucado and reacting to all the compromisers out there, that we may begin to circle the wagons and began to start looking, as we pointed out the other night, as God's church is this small group of little churches that lines up with what we feel to be important, and just to close ourselves there and begin to argue among ourselves and to just focus upon ourselves. And thus we have the, the, the uh, Phariseeism, uh, at least a, a, re a warmed over Phariseeism, you might say. And what are some signs that this can happen to us if we're not careful? Taking refuge through enclosing ourselves in our own little isolated world. Spending a little time out there trying to reach the lost with the gospel. And that's the next point. Little or no evangelism. There are some gospel preachers I know, and they're probably good gospel preachers in so many ways. And I doubt in the last year they've had one Bible study with a lost person. That's just not their priority. Oh, they, they'll spend a lot of time reading up and educating themselves, especially about controversies among brethren. And sometimes we need to do that. But the idea of going out and sitting across the table from a lost person and teaching him the basics about Christ and his teaching, they, have a, they just would have a hard time with that. I have a friend who was a little nervous because the congregation where he was preaching and invited a brother's known kind of to be like that. And they said, what can I talk to him about? And I said, maybe just ask him, what can we, what can we do to reach the lost? What are some ways that you go about trying to teach the lost? Try to get this focus on, on, on the world that's out there that needs the gospel of Christ so bad. That might help in dealing with this, this tendency that we might have to encircle ourselves. Uh, extreme discomfort in dealing with the lost. You know, when you bring lost people in and when you baptize them, they bring some problems with them. And it's not always a nice, eat, neat, and easy package to deal with. And I think sometimes some congregations just don't want things upset. And so there's, they're, they're uncomfortable with the lost. Well, how should we respond to 21st century paganism? You already know the answers. Imitating Jesus. Uh, can, we owe, can we deal with 21st century paganism by political activism? That's not going to do it. I have more Christian politicians. That's the solution. I heard somebody tell me that one time. That's not the way Jesus went about it. 
I think the keys are the same today that they were in the first century, that we sanctify ourselves. We separate ourselves from the world. And uh, that comes through the word of God, the truth of God's word. And that requires constant study, constant monitoring, constant prayer, <coughs> separation from the world in our manner of speech, in our entertainment, in our dress, intense, fervent love for each other. You know, that requires a lot of work. And sometimes we're just too busy to dedicate ourselves as we should to that intense, fervent love. Being known for our love requires effort. That means you're going to have to spend time when you're tired after work, calling some brethren, finding ways you can get them some food, babysitting for them. You know, that's, that's something you can do to help the mothers here. Uh, say, why don't you and your husband go out and have a, a nice night on the town and in the, in the nice sense of the word there. And I'll take care of your, your babies for you, your kids for you. That's the way that love can be extended. Fervent greetings. I like the way some of you are teaching your little children to go up and greet others. That's good. Have you ever noticed, and I'm going to preach on this one of these days, not tonight, don't worry. But have you ever noticed how often in the scriptures there are exhortations to greet, eat, greet one another with a holy kiss and, and, and how to greet each other fervently? That's important to help our, us develop that intense, fervent love. And that's the way we're going to reach the loss out there, by showing them with love a better way than the way of denominationalism, a better way than the way of paganism. You know, there's an interesting point along this line that someone pointed out to me one time. In Acts chapter 19, you remember Paul dealt with paganism at, at Ephesus. And in Acts 19, after so many of the people there in Asia became Christians, they had a riot. But what, the, the, um, but what was said about Paul and his companions to try to calm the right down is very interesting to me. Uh, the, the town officer, the city clerk, got up and when trying to quiet them down, look what he said about them in verse 37. He said, for you have brought these men here, talking about Paul and the other Christians, who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. Does that tell you something about Paul's tactics in dealing with paganism in Ephesus? Did Paul go in challenging the priest of the goddess of Diana to a public debate? Did he ridicule the goddess of Diana, this stupid, idiotic superstition? This bunch of idiots going here thinking some kind of a meteor's falling down. Why, that's absurd. That's not the way they did it. Instead, it was a loving teaching, a loving holiness. I had a brother from the Dominican Republic told me something like this. He said, if you have a dog that's chewing on an old bone and you try to go and take that bone away from him, what's he going to do? He's going to bite you. Unless it's Piccadilly, he's such a nice dog. But most dogs are going to bite you. How are you going to get the dog away from that old dried up bone? The best way to do is take a nice T-bone steak and put it right next to the dog. And then what's he going to do? Is he going to stick with the bone? He's going to leave the bone and go to the T-bone steak. That's what the Apostle Paul and other Christians did to overcome paganism. They didn't try to jerk it out of their teeth. They showed a better way, a way of holiness, a way of love. And those people that had open and honest hearts who were looking for something deeper willingly left the old bone of paganism and followed after Jesus Christ. And of course, a great and intense faith. That's the way we're going to deal with paganism. This is the victory that overcomes the world. Even our vote. I'm not saying it's wrong to vote, but that's not going to change the world. Even this political candidate. Even this movement, what is the faith, what is, I've already said it, what is the, going to help us overcome the world? Our faith. The Romans tried to beat them, they tried to stone them, they tried to torture them, they tried to kill them, tried to stamp them out. But that holiness, love, and faith overcame the world's greatest military machine. And that's the way we as individuals can successfully deal with paganism today. And if for some reason we're not successful in our own lives and in influencing others, it's because we haven't done 
we haven't developed these three keys in our lives as well as we should have. We haven't sanctified ourselves. We haven't developed that intense, fervent love. Or we haven't developed that great faith. We're in a war. We have paganism against us. May God help us to avoid that compromising spirit of the Sadducees. May he help us to avoid that internal wrangling and internal focus of the Pharisees, those that just doesn't work. May he help us instead to imbibe the spirit of Christ, his holiness, his intense love and his faith, which overcomes the world. What did Paul tell the, what did Peter tell the people on the day of Pentecost? Be saved from this perverse generation. Satan wants you to be swallowed up in this perverse generation. Wants you to have an empty, meaningless life like most of the people around us. But Christ wants you to overcome. You decide whose side you'll be on. Satan's side or Christ's side. Someone tonight want to declare themselves to be on Christ's side? Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Those are the initial steps which put us in the Lord's army to battle against Satan. If someone who hasn't done it, we can help you in doing that tonight. If we can help anyone else in any other way to fight against the ungodly influences around about us, let us know. We can pray for you. We can study with you. You let us know and we can help in any way that we can.